pulled up to the curb in front of him. Bruce Springsteen cocked his head for one of those, are you the guy looks? And when I waved back, he smiled. We shook hands on the sidewalk, and I followed him to the kitchen door at the back of his Aunt Dora's house. Later, after I chatted with Dora and went out for pizza with Bruce, we were back on the sidewalk making plans to meet again the next day. Now I got to give you the Jersey hug, he said. He threw his arms over my shoulders. I thumped his trapeze eye in turn. And for a moment, it was like, how did this happen? Actually, I already knew that. I'd spent the last two years researching and writing a biography that until that day had not included any input from its subject. So in that moment, my brain whirled like a macro processor, determined to take in, analyze, and cross-reference every microscopic element of the moment. Not just how he spoke and stood, but also the content and subtext of his words and movements. What was he doing here, really? I needed to interpret everything and anticipate how I could incorporate it into a book manuscript that was already two weeks overdue. I had a lot to think about, and nearly all of it springing directly from the evening of December 20th, 1978, when I saw Springsteen tear into the opening bars of Badlands in the smoky dark of the Seattle Center Arena. I was a sophomore in high school, 15 years old and chubby, with no real sense of the grown-up world, let alone my place in it. But when that 29-year-old guitarist confronted the microphone with proclamations about trouble in the heartland and a head-on collision happening in his guts, man, I heard something so raw and unrelenting I knew it had to be the truth, and that somewhere down the road, he described, I'd find my own future. I said, roll down the window and let the wind roll back your hair. Well, the night's busted open, these two lanes will take us anywhere. When we left Aunt Dora's house, Bruce took me to Federici's on Freehold's Main Street and introduced me to his buddies at the bar. He took the leftover slice they urged him to have and pointed the way to a back table where beers and shots of tequila quickly appeared. A pizza came next, and when the time came to leave, he snatched the check. My town, my money, he explained. When I got into my rental car, he checked rush hour traffic on Main and instructed me to follow him on the secret back way out of Freehold. When a traffic light separated us, he pulled over, dialed my cell phone, and told me where he was waiting to lead me home. He picked me up at my hotel the next morning and took me to his property in Colts Neck, just a few miles east of Freehold. We talked without interruption for four hours, then went up the road so he could play the songs he had recorded for his new album. When we got to the studio, Springsteen led the way to the control board, where two sets of lyrics sat in front of a couple chairs. After apologizing in advance for the volume, musicians like their music loud. He nodded to the engineer, cueing the tribal drums that herald the start of We Take Care of Our Own. Next came Easy Money, then Shackled and Drawn, then an electrified studio take of American Land. I listened and read along on the lyric sheet. But mostly I watched Bruce listen to his own work. I saw him nod to the beat, then abruptly stop, cocking his ear and giving a tiny twist to a knob just to make it all sound slightly more perfect. So let's think again of that 15-year-old kid back in 1978. Or let's forget him entirely and think about anyone who gets the opportunity to hang with a childhood hero. It's dreamy, crazy dreamy. The beer and the pizza, the tequila shots, the endless conversations, the in-studio preview of the not-quite-finished album. For months, Springsteen's friends had said the same thing about what he was like in person. He's pretty much exactly who you think he is, but of course, who we think Bruce Springsteen is, springs entirely from Bruce Springsteen's own vision of who he is, or who he wants people to think he is. So tell me what I see When I look in your eyes Is that you, baby? Or just a brilliant disguise? Just around the corner from Aunt Dora's house on McLean Street lies an empty lot that once held the house where Springsteen spent his earliest years 
living with a manic depressive father whose illness made consistent employment an impossibility. Bruce's mother worked as a secretary, but the family was poor and mainstream society unsympathetic. Viewed generally as a loser, the teenage Bruce kept to himself until rock and roll sent him reeling. When he picked up a guitar, Bruce was transformed and has spent the rest of his life remembering that magic and forever finding ways to recreate it in bigger and better ways. And so the live young singer took on the muscles and poise of a superhero. He became a global icon and something like a national monument. And when he bumped into a friend of mine during his 2008 tour, and the guy requested an extremely obscure 25-year-old outtake, Springsteen stopped the next night's concert in its tracks to tell everyone about how he'd met this guy who had asked for a song the band had never even considered performing live. Until that moment, of course, when he dedicated the world premiere of None But The Brave to my buddy. The guy's feet didn't hit the ground for six months after that, but when I asked Bruce what the moment had meant to him, he said he didn't even remember it. I do that all the time, man, he said. That's my job. I make miracles happen. And you know what? It is a job, a labor-centric job. And as the next months passed, I saw Springsteen run his band through military precise rehearsals. I saw him have a temper tantrum aimed at a spotlight operator who wasn't even at work yet and saw his face go white when I asked the wrong question at the wrong time. Sometimes I wondered how much of it all was artifice. I recalled his displays of ego and impatience and suspected that maybe I'd learned too much about this guy who had once seemed so heroic to me. Yeah, but then the house lights would go down and I'd be in the audience and see it all happening again. The one-time loser born anew, the teenage loser finding his feet, the screwed up guitar player who for all the world is standing, playing, and singing, and being exactly who he so desperately needed to be. Oh, this train, Mary saints and sinners, this train, That's Casey Neal on the guitar, Jim Brunberg on the piano. Thanks. Yeah, so um, that was a great story. Um, Thank <laughs> and, you. Well, there were, there were parts of it, 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 it was interesting because uh, obviously there, there were some parts of that story in the book and um, there, there is this obvious, like there, there were some incredibly sweet stories about him. A lot of stories about him working so hard to get things exactly right in the studio that Steve Van Zant, you know, quit and uh, Cla he drove Clarence Clemens crazy. Um, what was it in him that made him want things to be so perfect? He's a control freak. Or what freak. is it? Well, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> He's a control freak. He grew up in a very unstable home um, and felt, uh, uh, you know, grew up with the sense that absolutely nothing could be controlled until he picked up the guitar. And that was his ticket toward not only being able to find some vision of himself that felt right and true and, and perfect, but also keep things rolling in exactly the way he wanted them to go. Well, what, I mean, there, are, there was also a story where he was watching the Beatles on television and he just said, I don't want to be famous like that. They don't have any friends. Yeah. And yet he had to have a drive to be famous in order to, for this to have happened, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, if 30 years of therapy have done anything, it's make the man very comfortable with his own paradoxes. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and so on the one hand, he's this completely, you know, he's this, this determined artist who will never sacrifice anything for his art. But on the other hand, he's also had to come to terms with the idea that he's like super into being the biggest rock and roll star in the world. Yeah. And yeah. that took him a long time to get to that place. And when he did, it was with a vengeance, if you remember, in the mid 80s. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, so he's, and obviously he's, he's walked the balance since then. 
Well, and there's also, there's an incredibly sweet story in the book about um, Bruce going to see Stardust Memories by himself. Can you talk about that story? Yeah, yeah, you know, he, um, it, it was a tour in 1980 and he was hanging out by himself uh, one day. He was a loner, man, even back in the days when he was the biggest rock star, you know, uh, one of the bigger rock stars on the planet. And he went out to see a movie by himself and uh, was sitting there eating his popcorn and this, this kid just walked up and saw him there, this high school guy, and, and said, um, you know, could, could, I, could I sit with you? And he said, yeah, sure, could I bring my sister? Well, yeah, so they saw this Woody Allen movie, which of course is a huge takedown of the whole idea of fame, where the fans are like these monstrous sort of Bergman-esque creatures. And so yeah. this kid, you know, as the story goes, the lights came up and he was looking a little unsettled and he goes, is that what it's like? And Bruce said, no, it's not like that at all. You know, I, I like this. And the guy goes, well, you want to come home and meet my parents? <laughs> And he said, okay, you know, the guy's got nowhere to go till yeah. tomorrow night when he's playing at, you know, the 20,000 seat basketball arena. So they, they, you know, they hop in the car and they drive over to the guy's parents' house and they have one of those, you know, look who I got here. And they were like, <laughs> they were like, no. And he ran, literally ran to his room and got the copy of The River, which had a big picture of Bruce on it. And yeah. he was just like, see? <laughs> and then it was like, hey. So, you know, they made dinner, they sat around, they talked till like 2, 3 in the morning, and, uh, you know, that's just how the guy is. Well, and he says something interesting in the book about how in the first 10 minutes, he gets people's entire life and probably more than their best friend or their family mm -hmm. know about them. Is that him or is it just fame? I mean, is he that kind of guy? Well, he takes the fame and is actually interested in other people. And so when he gets into that situation, and that was more, you know, when, when I wrote about that in the book, it, it occurred to me that, especially in that time in his life, that was symptom, uh, symptomatic of, of a problem. The guy had an intimacy problem. So he sort of, in order to sort of, to, to, to have a kind of relationship or have the sort of feeling of getting to know somebody, he would be on his star pedestal and spend a couple hours with you and never see you again, you know? Hmm. I mean, that kid and his family got tickets and they still do, you know, yeah. <laughs> whenever they come to town, it's like they just write in and, and John Landell sends them whatever they need. Wow. But, uh, but at the time, it seemed more kind of pathological to me. Well, you also talk in the book about, and I didn't realize that he had struggled with depression for quite yeah. a while. And then in 2003, he went on antidepressants and had one of the most productive periods of his professional life. And you are a fan did you notice a difference in his music after 2003, after that happened? No, no, just that there was a whole lot more of it. The creation, you know, the composing and creating had never been his problem. His problem was having the confidence in the finished work to bring it out. Mm -hmm. So this guy has got, I mean, he could uh, lose his voice and his fingers tomorrow and there would be new Bruce Springsteen records for 30 years because every time he makes a record, he's actually making three records. And then the other ones just go into the vault. Yeah, because he's so ridiculously productive. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So you know, he developed a sense of confidence, and I, and I think also his 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 personal life must have uh, become that much more pleasant from day sure. to day. Sure. Yeah. The boy. Yeah. Because as, I mean, as it turns out, the boy has demons. Mm -hmm. Well, I, my guess is that anyone in that position would. Um, we all do. <laughs> so um, it, he's human, but but. Um, He's definitely, he's unquestionably an icon. Uh, he's mm -hmm. just one of those, you know, there's, there's a few American icons. He's one of them. What, why do you believe that he has that role? Why do you think that he became an icon? Because he desperately needed to become one. Because it was a lot easier than being him. Yeah. Because when you look at somebody like that, and that was the point that I was struggling around with in the story I just read, you know, in the same way that people invest themselves or project themselves into these people who, you know, celebrities or stars or writers or artists who seem to connect with them in some way, um, that person themselves is covering for some emptiness in themselves that they n desperately need to, to fill with the affirmation of an audience. And you can see the way Bruce works the crowd and, 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 and the way that he just would sort of, especially in the early years, almost crucify himself on the microphone. You know, I'm a prisoner of rock and roll, he'd scream after three and a half, four hours. Yeah. And it was like they had to carry him off. And there was no joke about it. I mean, it was all, because as he said later, he goes, I had nowhere else to go. <laughs> he had no life, you know, that was everything on stage. Yeah. Well, and he also, there's a quote where he says, I want to give people 
something perfect that they exactly. can't get anywhere else in their life. And the book is the book is amazing. Um, Thank you. Uh, the book is Bruce, a uh, biography of Bruce Springsteen, the author Peter Ames Carlin. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.